The mini taper barrel happened in the early 1950s when Buffet uh, produced their uh, now famous R13 model clarinet. A clarinet that uh, was a small bore clarinet that had some tuning improvements that small bore clarinets have over large bore clarinets, but also had some of the depth and resonance that uh, clarinet players generally desired uh, in larger bore clarinets. Well, the complaint in America was this. Uh, we like your clarinet, it's fine. And by the way, that, that R13 was originally supplied uh, with a 65 millimeter barrel, not a 66 millimeter barrel. Uh, they said, we like your clarinet, that's fine, but we absolutely hate your mouthpiece. Your mouthpiece uh, sounds like a tin box. It's, uh, the bore is way too small and uh, the sound is way too bright. So uh, clarinet players in America continued to insist on playing their large bore clarinet mouthpieces, or Shedville style bores, um, and later then the Casper style bores that developed in the 50s. Those were mostly low pitched uh, large bores and uh, players in Europe, generally speaking, didn't play large bore mouthpieces. There was a certain problem, especially with flatness in the high register on the R13, it always has been, and uh, one of the corrections for it was to play the smaller bore mouthpieces with a cylindrical barrel. Well, as clarinet players continue to insist on playing large bore mouthpieces here in America, uh, the flatness problem sort of persisted, and uh, one of the things that was um, uh, uh, put together to compensate for it was what was called a manic taper barrel. And the manic taper barrel essentially is an inverse taper. It's larger at the top than it is at the bottom, as you can see in the diagram here. Uh, it has a choke uh, at the bottom, so it sort of compensates for that added um, uh, that added uh, a volume in the uh, in the large bore mouthpiece and helps make uh, just minor corrections. I mean, really minor corrections in the tuning. Uh, what the uh, mini taper barrel really does uh, is that by supplying that choke or that that slight taper at the bottom, it creates a venturi that uh, brings together the sound, gives us the sound a little more core uh, in the R13. Um, the R13 tends to be an instrument that is um, unstable in its parameters, in my opinion, uh, and uh, the sound easily spreads, and uh, this mani taper barrel brings the sound back together a little bit, especially when you're playing large bore mouthpieces, which already provide a, a considerable amount of resonance. So a lot of people wonder exactly how on earth did that 9,000th taper uh, come about? How did uh, Manning arrive at uh, just uh, 9 thousandths choke there uh, from bottom to top from 589 to 590? Well, that's a very interesting question and we're going to talk about that after this public service message from the Federal Bureau of Instigation. The following is a test of the unbelievably horrible National Disaster Alert System. Repeat. The following is only a test. We're all gonna die! The following was only a test. Repeat, was only a test. If this had actually been an unbelievably horrible national disaster, you would have been given the location of your nearest graveyard, told to cover your head and walk toward it. All right then. Okay, I, I, uh, <clears throat> it's always nice to know that the, uh, that the uh, Federal Bureau of Instigation is always looking out for us. And uh, with that delightful message, let's continue on with our discussion on mainly taper barrels. Or maybe we could just cover our heads and walk toward a graveyard. I asked myself that question several times, uh, and when I was teaching clarinet in, in, uh, at Wesleyan University, um, I got into technical things on the clarinet, and uh, I got to be very good friends with the machinists there at the university. So 
Uh, anyway, I brought a project over there to the head of the machine department, and I asked him, I said, can you put a 9,000th taper in, in, uh, uh, in a reamer? I need it for a clarinet barrel. I need it to, the taper to be so long and to have a top dimension of this and a bottom dimension of that. And he said, uh, that would be no problem. So I left the project with him, and very soon he came up with the, uh, uh, with the reamer for me. I was surprised at how fast he did it. So I said, gee, how, how did you guys do this so fast? And he said, uh, well, he said, you're just asking for a standard taper. Uh, I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, when I calculated out the taper that you gave me, uh, I found out that's just a Morse taper, a number two Morse taper. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with machine shops and stuff, uh, uh, there are certain standard tapers that are used, say, uh, for f various fittings. Uh, for instance, a number two Morse taper is a standard fitting for uh, many tailstocks in, in uh, the lathes at the, in shops at that time. I'm not sure what is going on now uh, because of all the com changes computers have made, uh, but in any case uh, there were number one, number two, number three Morse tapers and um, apparently uh, what uh, Manig did to arrive at that reverse taper is he simply picked up a number two uh, a Morse taper reamer from his shop and hand reamed uh, a, a certain top dimension in the barrel and the bottom dimension fell where it was and it happened to be with that length inside the barrel happened to be nine nine thousandths. That's, that's the way it arrived out and yet many clarinet players think that this is this mystical number that you have to have that makes uh, the clarinet play right and if you don't have a many taper barrel somehow your clarinet is underperforming. Well that's complete nonsense, and uh, this uh, mysticism, uh, I think, is uh, is all cleared up and shown for the hoax that it is, uh, just by a little bit of of uh, clear-headed technical analysis. But the question is: is is a many taper barrel un universally uh, beneficial for your playing? We're going to answer that question in the next section.